this is Dr. Kamar Shima, and I'm honored and thrilled to have with me uh, Dr. Aditi Malhotra, uh, who is the editor in chief of the Canadian Army Journal. Uh, and formerly, she has worked as the co editor of the Journal for Intelligence, Propaganda, and Security Studies for Aus in, Australia, uh, in Austria. And uh, she holds a PhD in political science. Uh, uh, and uh, she has been doing great work when it comes to research writing. So I requested her to come on my platform and come on my show and speak about Canada, Canada's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy and also uh, we can talk about um, how things are being shaped uh, with India as well. Uh, so Dr. Aditi, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to have a, you know, this small chit chat and that is about how do you see Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, many in India, they are calling that uh, India is, is at the center of the strategy in the wake of uh, uh, everyone around the world is moving towards Indo-Pacific. So um, the way Americans and the others are coming towards Indo-Pacific, they need India uh, to implement the strategy. How do you see Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy and, uh, and uh, how do you see India's role in this? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, of course, you know, uh, there's little surprise in the fact that uh, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy has been like a longer way to document. And uh, it's been one of the uh, last few countries to come up with their Indo-Pacific vision, you know, especially in the Western world. But uh, what's really interesting in the uh, document, if you look at it, are two very specific aspects, right? One of them is, you know, the acknowledgement and the recognition of the China challenge with the rise of China. And if you look at the language, which is quite hardened as compared to how, you know, we see other Canadian, uh, you know, a narrative about China, it has hardened because we see, uh, you know, China being mentioned in terms of its uh, active pursuit of economic and strategic interests, in terms of its unilateral claims, foreign interference, and coercive treatment of you know, regional actors in the Indo-Pacific. So this is one of the very prominent aspects of the strategy, wherein uh, China is actually mentioned more than 50 times. And then there's this positive aspect to the strategy, wherein there's an acknowledgment you know, in Ottawa that whatever happens in the region actually affects uh, Canada and its prosperity and its regional security. So there's this uh, dimension about, you know, uh, the Indo-Pacific as a center of economic dynamism and a horizon of opportunity for Canada and also strategic challenge. But then there's this, you know, this positive aspect of how Canada wants to be a much more constructive and a much more present actor in the region and actually help the region and also shape the region in a more, towards a more positive uh, direction as it, you know, if we look at how things have been in terms of the strategic flux, Canada wants to play a constructive role in this aspect and that becomes quite prominent you know in the strategy document but at the same time when it comes to India because India forms you know a crucial aspect of the Indo-Pacific so the Indo a lot of people tend to equate it to India and its presence in the Indian Ocean region so if you look at that in terms of uh, you know how Canada looks at India there's a nuance there because Canada and India's relations have not been the best in the recent years. Instead, they've been getting better more recently after Trudeau, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau's recent election. And in this term, that there's a sense that I see, you know, within Canada and within India, that there is a lot more scope for improvement. And there is like a recognition from both sides that, you know, they need to work on the converging aspects of, you know, converging interest and start working together on a lot of aspects. So in this thing, we noticed that India forms a very prominent part in the strategy when it comes to, you know, uh, strategic engagement, people to people ties, and a lot of other aspects in terms of access to market, uh, in terms of investments, and a lot of similar aspects. But what's very conspicuous and, you know, very prominent is how India is kind of missing from the military aspect or from the defense cooperation aspect in the Indo-Pacific strategy. And what's very interesting is how we see that Canada seeks to eventually find more areas of engagement with India. And it also very specifically mentions including security. 
So it looks like that Canada is looking and seeking new opportunities to partner and engage uh, India on a lot of aspects. But at the same time, you know, we've seen that there have been some sticking aspects, some controversial aspects between the two uh, countries. And if they can be worked upon, as I said, that's something that both sides have been working on. But in terms of defense, I think it is more a work in progress as opposed to, you know, a clear, uh, a clear, a more concrete engagement at this point in time. So, Dr. Aditi, can you just explain us that, uh, do you see that uh, uh, right now, after this court, quarter letter security dialogue, some other countries like Canada and many others, Netherlands, Germany, they have come up with a different doctrine. So, do you see that... Uh, uh, there is a probability that they they may come under one platform uh, one thing and the second do you think that do you think that india is in difficulty engaging everyone uh, because everyone is coming up with this uh, doctrine or do you believe that uh, it's good for india if india stays bilaterally uh, with them in indo pacific okay so again there are a lot of aspects to unpack here and i'll start with the fact how there are a lot of countries which are, of course, looking at, you know, the developments in the region, whether it is Quad or whether it's other trilateral settings or minilateralism. Of course, all the countries are engaging the region and through different formats. So it's not just bilateral or trilateral or minilateral. There are way too many formats at that point in time. And I would not say that all the countries can come under one structure as such, because I think that also kind of in the long term becomes counterproductive. And I personally see it as, you know, if any country has to be successful in the Indo-Pacific region, it's very important for them to focus on the functions of each of these, you know, structures and not just focus on the structure. Like if you have all the countries joining the Quad, you know, it may seem like a decent idea, but then it what's actually going to determine the success is how they function in terms of actually achieving you know things as opposed to just being a part of the structure just to be a part of the structure so in that sense if you look at it yes a lot of countries are interested and i believe with time we will see the rise of many more formats of engagement and it may not be just quad or AUKUS. of course these are very prominent you know uh, aspects of cooperation but i feel there would be many more coming up and some of them will have specific you know uh, ad hoc uh, initiatives some of them permanent uh, presence in oh, oh, sorry this will have permanent presence in a lot of ways so i think we're likely to see a lot more happening in that regard and your second question about uh, india facing difficulty when it comes to dealing with the western countries or you know southeast asian countries or east asian countries i think for india it it has been more an aspect of strategic opportunity as opposed to an area of challenges now, if we just go back to, say, the Cold War or, you know, the early times after the fall of the USSR, we noticed how India was very reluctant about having more and more foreign powers getting involved in the Indian Ocean region. And that time there was a sense of threat perceptions, you know, with more greater foreign involvement. But if you look at the India of today, right, whether it's in terms of the economic capacity, whether it's in terms of India as a maritime actor in the region, I feel there's a great sense of confidence in India wherein it's willing to engage these Western partners without really getting worried or finding it difficult. Of course, I'm not saying that there are no challenges at all. There are, you know, sets of diverging aspects, sets of convergences as well. But what I see is how despite some of the problems and despite some of the challenges, I do see New Delhi kind of interacting with a range of actors on a lot of aspects. I still feel that India could do much better when it comes to non-bilateral settings, because even now, to a great extent, the preference is still, you know, kind of tilted towards bilateral engagement with all these partners and uh, countries. But I feel that with time, India is likely, you know, it's already a part of so many other formats of engagement. But I think with time, India will get more and more confident in dealing and may kind of, you know, tap into these opportunities that exist. So, Aditi, how do you see this, uh, that, okay, everyone is coming in Indo-Pacific and Ch coming mm -hmm. in the Chinese backyard, that's fine, that makes sense, okay, that we have to counter China's rise. But do you believe that all these countries who are also mentioning India as a major strategic partner, are they going to help India in case of any conflict with China? 
To be very frank, you know, when it comes to international relations as such, every country is looking to maximize their own national interests. Rarely would you see a country engaged in a, re a region just because it wants to cater to other countries' interests. So all the engagement that we see is largely because different countries find that there are overlapping areas of interest with other countries, which is why we see, you know, a lot of Western actors getting involved in the region because they notice that there are overlapping areas of interest. So I would say any country that's involved in the region is largely there for their own interest to begin with. Now, when it comes to the China challenge, of course, you know, every country, all these countries are talking to each other about how to manage it. And within this, there are different visions for how every country wants to manage it. In case there's a conflict between India and uh, you know, China, we'll actually notice that India would largely want it to remain bilateral in nature. It would not want to include a lot of foreign powers in their bilateral dispute. Having said that, if push comes to shove and India is unable to manage, you know, China militarily, there are there's great likelihood that it will seek diplomatic support, strategic support, and even military support from a lot of these partners, such as U.S. or France, because we've already seen how India's dependence towards Russia has gone down after 2000, you know, and it's only likely to get you know, less dependent on Russia because of all the problems that Russia itself is going through. So we will see a lot greater engagement of India with these Western actors, whether it's in terms of, you know, military acquisitions and procurement, whether it's in terms of uh, research and development, or even if we look at something as basic as how they look at the China challenge and want to deal with it. So I think that is likely to be how the trajectory would go ahead. Hmm. So, um, in every Indo-Pacific doctrine, and particularly in Canada's doctrine as well, I, uh, the, the the most important thing is that yes, there have been traditional security challenges, but everybody is talking about the non-traditional security challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. So, one of those is the supply chain. For example, India these days is calling as if uh, uh, the Chinese want to start a biological war uh, against India, for instance, uh, and maybe a new variant of. Uh, uh, a new COVID variant can come in and that can hamper the growth uh, of India. So do you believe that uh, how much uh, uh, India will have uh, the support of the international community or how much India will be looked at as far as this uh, issue of supply chain is concerned? Because uh, India has a lot of labor, manpower. Uh, so do you think that uh, that is also one of the way that the world is, the, the Canadians are looking at India uh, from the perspective of the supply chain uh, and with every passing day it is becoming difficult to trust uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the President Xi Jinping uh, and the way we have seen during this COVID. So how this aspect is being uh, seen uh, of uh, the this, this aspect of supply chain and the non-traditional security? I think non-traditional security aspects and even things, you know, when it comes to economic aspects and resilience of supply chains, I think these are very prominent and important aspects from Canada's point of view, and they do get very prominently featured in the strategy document. And I think that's quite welcoming because if you look at the document, it's very comprehensive when it talks about all the challenges that it faces in terms of these non-traditional security aspects as well. There's a lot of mention about how Canada wants to uh, help the region through capacity building. It wants to help the region in terms of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So these are all those aspects which get prominently, you know, highlighted when it comes to non-traditional aspects. And at the same time, as you said, you know, supply chains, the resilience of supply chains remains a very crucial aspect, more so as a lot of countries are trying to decouple from, from China when it comes to a lot of economic issues. So in that aspect, I think, again, there are opportunities for India that it can offer to the region. But one has to note that India has not been able to build up the capacity as much as 
it could have, or as much as it is expected from a lot of foreign powers, because they presume that if India could do much more in terms of integrating itself within the larger Indo-Pacific region, whether it's in terms of supply chains or economics or other aspects, India has not done it as well as a lot of countries would have expected. And the domestic considerations have taken over when it comes to a lot of these aspects. So, but again, you know, with time, as things get more and more, you know, concrete and there are more tangible gains that we get out of these engagements, I think, of course, you know, the supply chain is going to feature increasingly and more prominently in the coming future. So, Didi, how do you see that uh, we have seen that uh, uh, Canada uh, has uh, issues uh, with uh, China, uh, even, you know, at the G20 when we saw that President Xi Jinping and Mr. Trudeau uh, didn't had a good exchange uh, and that was, that came on <clears throat> that came on media, and at the at the same time, um, you mentioned yourself uh, uh, in your, one of the answers that India does not, the Canada doesn't enjoy that much good ties with India. So, how much difficulty it finds to be in the region, and uh, is this just to follow the suit? Is this just to follow the other countries, or do you think that uh, the Canadians really have something concrete to do uh, in the region? That's a very good question. So if you look at how uh, Canada has looked at the region so far, there it's not that Canada has been totally missing from the region. It has been relatively inactive when you compare it to the other actors or when you when you compare it to how Canada was, say, you know, much before during the 80s and the 70s, wherein Canada was much more actively involved in the region, whether it's economically or whether it's security wise. Of course, you know, we have seen how Canada kind of dipped in terms of its engagement of the region. But now I think there is a growing recognition within Canada that it needs to be a part of this region and it needs to engage the region much more constructively if it really wants to re retain or remain a relevant actor in the region. Because if it does not do so, not only does it you know, have the worry about remaining irrelevant to what's happening. But at the same time, Canada will not be able to shape the region in a manner which kind of benefits Canada. Because Canada has been a part of, you know, the whole uh, the whole structure after the Second World War that we've seen. And Canada's benefited from it. Also because Canada was one of the founders, you know, of the structure. And as you see the structure shifting, the international, you know, order actually changing, which is kind of detrimental to Canada's interest. It realized that it needed to be there. And despite being a late actor to the region, I see and I feel that yes, Canada has a lot to offer and it is serious about offering. Of course, you know, if you look at the financial aspect that is mentioned in the strategy, there is greater scope for more funding. But the fact that the funding was mentioned and it was stated that, you know, it kind of gives you the impression that this is not just an initiative or just a ad hoc project that Ottawa wants to, in, you know, is interested in, it clearly is looking at itself as a very credible and a sustained partnership with a lot of these countries in the Indo-Pacific. Mm, that's great. Uh, let's see what comes out of this because um, the challenges are great and uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is to be in India uh, next month, next year, obviously, for the G20 and how much it can be of value for promoting uh, India-Canada ties. And at the, at the same time, I think uh, the Indian diaspora in Canada uh, is all working very good and uh, they're a very positive force in the, in the, in the soft power uh, for India as well and a good connect between India and Canada. Uh, but let's see how this uh, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy is uh, is in a position even further to either uh, create uh, either that creates more opportunities for India uh, and Canada or that uh, it comes in competition with other countries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Aditi, for your time uh, for my show. Thank you so much for having me.